All right, I'll call the meeting to order. And we do recognize that we meet on the traditional territory of the Latakodeni Nation. Um, of course, it was perfect timing. Is that your alarm? Make sure you're up at 6 so you can attend council kind of thing. So, um, uh, With respect to approval of the agenda, as noted, uh, it, uh, the agenda is as is. So, Councillor Runch, so moved. Councillor Goulet, second. Any questions or comments on the agenda? All in favour? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, adopting the regular minutes of October 27th. Councillor Paul, so moved. Councillor Vic, second. Questions or comments? All in favour? Any opposed? Carried. All right, tonight we have a delegation, uh, and is it Marika? Marek. Do you want, are you go going to come up? And then we have uh, Chris and Tara on the phone. So you'll do the introductions at the start of who's who. So as soon as Gina has you all up, the floor will be yours. You need music for these interludes. Just, you know, if you're going to play the Vanna White, we need some kind of music for it. Okay, does this work? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so um, my name is Marika Moore. I'm the Wild Safe BC Caribou Coordinator. And on the phone with me, I have Conservation Officer Christopher Ford, who's responsible for Quinell and Area and Tara Grady from the Caribou Regional District, who is the supervisor of solid waste management. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for giving me the time to speak tonight, and I would also like to acknowledge that we're in the traditional ter territory of the Takodina. Um, tonight, I would like to tell you a little bit about what WildSafe BC does and how we can prevent human wildlife conflict in the Caribou and in the city of Quenelle. So first of all, I would like to give you a little bit of an overview of um, the BC Conservation Foundation and Wild Safe BC. Then I would like to tell you a little bit about our programs and what I've done this season. And then I'll hand it over to Chris, who will talk about the wild wildlife situation in the city of Quenelle. And then I'll have Tara speak a little bit more to the outline of the program. So WildSafe BC is owned and delivered by the BC Conservation Foundation. And it's, um, the BC Conservation Foundation is a non-for-profit that was founded in 1969. The mandate is to promote and to assist in the conservation of fish and wildlife resources. And we are a designated contractor to the province of BC. WildSafe BC is the provincial leader in preventing conflict with wildlife, and we do that through collaboration, education, and community solutions. So if you have not heard of WildSafe BC, you might have heard of the program Bear Aware. And um, Bear Aware was set up in 1994 in Revelstoke because there was a need for education to help with the reduction of bear conflict. And then the BC Conservation Foundation was approached by the province to expand the program into different communities. And in 2013, the program was switched over to Wild Safe BC because it was recognized that there wasn't only bears that could come in conflict with humans, but also other wildlife. Our overarching goal and motto is keeping wildlife wild and our communities safe. So we don't play an advocacy role outside of prevention of human wildlife conflict. And we focus on long-term and sustainable solutions to reduce that conflict. So here's a quick overview of the 2019 program. We had 23 programs in 130 communities. This year we actually have 105, no sorry, we have 30 programs in 150 communities all throughout BC. And um, the BC Conservation Foundation, they hire local people. So I'm based out of Williams Lake for the Caribou. And um, they do a lot of training with us in the beginning. And the goal is that we work very closely with the communities and collaborate with them to prevent human wildlife for me in the Caribou. 
So now I would like to tell you a little bit about what I've done this season. So um, just for you to have a little bit of background, the um, CRD is one of the funders of this program. And 2019 was the first year where some parts of the program were introduced. And then this year is the first year where the program was totally run by the BC Conservation Foundation. The communities in which I delivered the programs were Williams Lake, 100 Mile House, 108 Mile Ranch, and the CRD part of Quinell. One program I would like to talk to you about is um, the garbage bin tagging. So it's a purely educational program. And um, as you might know, garbage bins are a strong attractant for bears. Even if they're not full, they carry the sense. And um, often this can lead to human wildlife conflict. So this program, what I would do is the night before collection, I would drive around and I would put these stickers, they're removable but highly visible, I would put those on the bins and they would work as a, as a reminder for people that there is bears around, that this is an attractant and it's supposed to encourage them to keep the bins inside until the morning of collection. So from my understanding, um, there was a new bylaw um, that was put in place this year, so that would work in accordance with it, right? Because it encourages the people to only put it out in the morning of collection. Um, on the right side, you can see a chart that shows a little bit of the results that we've had this year. So I did the bin tagging in 100 Mile House, 108 Mile Ranch, and Williams Lake. And in the first two communities, this is the second year where it was done. So the people were a little bit more used to it. Um, and so the first column, the blue one, shows the number of garbage bins that were put out early in my first round when I did the bin tagging, and then a month later I did a second round, and that is displayed by the green column. So in 100 Mile House, I covered 615 houses, and so 10% of these houses had their bins out early in the second round, and in the second, uh, sorry, in the first round, and in the second round it was reduced to 5%. In 108 Mile Ranch, the numbers are a little bit higher because I covered more houses. I covered 1,134 houses. And so 13% had the bins out in the first round and then only 6% in the second round. And in Williams Lake, the program is new and we don't, um, we like to kind of bring education in slowly, right? So that people get used to it, they know what these stickers mean. So um, I chose a test area in accordance with the conservation officer service where they had said they had some issues the previous year. So I um, did an area of 249 houses and um, so 21% of these houses had their bins out the first time and then 11% after. So for all these three communities, this was an overall reduction of 52% in the bins that had been placed out the night before, which is, in my opinion, a, a great achievement because the fewer bins we have out, the, the fewer risk of um, human wildlife conflict we have. not really moving forward. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. <laughs> you can let us know. Do you have a copy of yourself? Uh, yep. And then we can just split the slide. Okay. So for those on the phone, uh, the screen is frozen. So we're just going to go to a paper copy of our slides. Perfect. Yeah, so um, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about other programs that I've done in the community. So one of them is door hangers. So usually we would go around um, and do door-to-door -door campaigning. So we would knock on people's doors and let them know if there's issues with wildlife in the neighborhood. And so because of COVID, we couldn't do that. So we switched to door hangers. So I hung 962 door hangers in the um, Caribou Regional District. And um, so they, they consist basically of three things. There would be a um, neighborhood or community specific letter in accordance with the CRD. Um, that would talk about if there is a bear in the area or wildlife, if maybe the season is turning and there's lots of apple trees in the, in the area that need some attention. Um, 
And then we hand out on the door hangers different tips on how to prevent human wildlife conflict in general. And I always added um, a wildlife brochure, so in this case, black bear brochures, just so that people get also some background knowledge. Um, I also did six display booths this year. Unfortunately, a lot of events were obviously canceled because of COVID. Um, so this was a great way to interact with people and just get them to ask questions that they might not, you know, do through email or just to, in general to get in, in, in contact with them. Um, so I reached 344 people. It was also often kids that were just attracted by the booth and then they would bring their parents in so it would be kind of a family topic, right? So that was really nice to see. And then we have a program that's called Wild Safe Rangers. So we do presentations for kids from grade one to six. And I went to two schools in Williams Lake where I reached 360 students um, just talking about attractant management, how to stay safe in bear country, things like that. And then um, on the next chart, we would just see some other initiatives that we do. So um, I would do community group presentations. I presented to the Quinell Rotary Club in the beginning of the year. We have a new bear campsite program that started just this summer where we work with campgrounds on um, how to manage attractants better, how to keep everyone safe. We have the Wild Safe Business Pledge where we work with businesses. Um, I can do different workshops, electric fencing or bear spray, and we have a BC Goes Wild event every September. So these are just all different initiatives and activities that we can do with Wild Safe BC to help prevent human wildlife conflict. So now I would like to hand it over to Conservation Officer Chris to talk a little bit about the wildlife conflict in the city. Right on. Thanks, Marika. Um, yeah, sorry for not being able to attend in person. I, I did come down with the flu, and I'm negative for COVID, but just felt it more appropriate that I'd call in. So, um, And also, thank you very much for taking the time to, to hear from us. So, um, In Quinell, it's been a very busy year for bear conflicts. Um, it was such a wet start to the summer, which caused for a late berry crop. And unfortunately, those bears that got access to non-natural foods stuck around in town all summer, causing conflict. And typically, we'd see bear conflicts decline when fawns are born and berry crops ripen up. Um, black bears are the majority of human wildlife conflict reports to the CO service, and garbage is the main cause of the conflict. To date, I've received 528 human wildlife conflict reports, and again, the majority of those are just bears accessing garbage. So, um, throughout the summer months, I was dealing with between 35 and 45 bears uh, within town throughout the summer. Uh, the CO service has conducted several attracting audits on the west side of town uh, within Quinell, uh, where we see the majority of our bear conflicts. Uh, 39 dangerous wildlife protection orders uh, were issued to residential and commercial property owners to remove or properly secure their garbage. This kind of goes hand in hand with what WildSafe does in their uh, bin tagging program. Um, I'm a huge supporter of that program because it, it goes out and it provides that educational piece uh, for the residents so that they're aware that the consequences of having their insecure uh, garbage is put out early, uh, what the impacts can be for bears. So, And then on slide 16 here, or I, I don't know if you're able to get slide 16 up. Yeah, everyone can see it in their paper copies. Perfect. So slide 16 shows um, the city of Quinell, and I plotted through 2019 um, where the majority of our, our conflicts were occurring within town. So this is um, showing that we're having a concentration right within some of our busiest areas as well. Uh, so this isn't just an outlying area within Quinell itself. Um, and Marika was able to attend Red Bluff, uh, which is another high bear uh, conflict area this past summer, where she went door to door to provide education on attraction management. By doing so, I saw a decline in conflict reports, which allowed me to manage the bears that pose a higher public safety risk. So then I wasn't forced to have to deal with all the bear uh, garbage issues, uh, which was a huge uh, assistance to myself. Um, 
I also think that by doing the bin tagging program, we'll see um, it benefit the bylaws, bylaws not having to run around and provide education as well to um, to people with the early curbside. So it'll, it'll allow them to focus on some of their more priority issues uh, within town as well. So, um, you know, we, we're having, we're constantly seeing that um, we're continuing to have bears coming in into town. The main issue is, like I said, with garbage. Fortunately, on average, we're having to destroy uh, 11 to 12 bears a year. Uh, 2018 was a high conflict uh, year. We unfortunately had to destroy 34 bears within town. We suspected that that high concentration of bears coming into town were a direct relation to the wildfires and displacement from bears. Um, however, this year, 2020, we're seeing we have a higher conflict call volume on bear issues. And to date, we've had to destroy uh, 28 bears um, because they're posing such a high level uh, public safety risk. Um, so if uh, we'll continue with the slides and if anybody has any further questions or any questions at the end, you know, feel free to ask. Could you just uh, let us know what the the coloration of the little pins means? You got yellow, yeah, green, so, and red. Um, so the yellow, yellow is garbage, green are siding. Uh, there's black pins, which were property damage. Um, and then there was another pin in there for aggressive, sorry, it's small on my screen as well here. But um, big uh, yellow would be garbage, green is just siding, so. Oh, I see, okay. thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so then um, on the next slide, basically, um, I hope that I could show that Wild Safe BC supports communities in reducing the conflict between humans and wildlife. And if the city of Quesnel was in favor of partnering with the Caribou Regional District for the next season, um, me, if I'm still the coordinator next year or whoever will do the job, um, would be able to dedicate more hours specifically to Quinell. So I'll just have Tara briefly talk about the outlines of the program from the CID point of view. Tara? Thanks, Marike. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, you bet. Okay. Uh, so as uh, Marike pointed out, uh, 2019, the CRD uh, came late into the program, so we, we didn't partner um, with uh, Wild Safe as far as funding, so we hired our own coordinator and just focused uh, mostly on the 108 and Hunter Mile House because that's where we were seeing uh, the most uh, issues with bears, specifically in regards to our curbside collection. And leading into 2020, um, we completed the application form uh, with Wild Safe to uh, partner with them. So this year's program was uh, partially funded. So there was um, more than more than half of the cost of the program was actually uh, provided by Wild Safe BC, uh, and the Caribou Regional District um, contributed six thousand um, dollars towards the program, so there's great value in being able to uh, coordinate with uh, Wild Safe BC, plus it's, it's much less labor intensive than running it ourselves. The year before that, um, there was a lot more administrative and planning um, that uh, the CRD had to take on, and this year, um, you know, Wild Safe is a very well, um, well planned, and uh, there's a lot of experience um, support in the province uh, for the coordinator so it was uh, uh, hands off uh, as far as as kind of um, coordinating the program which was was great from an administrative uh, perspective uh, so the program isn't guaranteed on a year-to-year -year basis um, participants have to uh, complete an application um, the application for the 2021 programs uh, will come out in January and uh, the CRD intends to put an application again. Um, if the City of Cornell is interested in partnering with us, 
uh, to help fund next year's program and then be able to participate um, in the program, then I would just need to know that in advance of January so that I can include that information in our application form. And we can discuss um, how much the city is able to contribute, uh, what kind of hours they're looking for. Uh, for instance, this year, the city of Williams Lake did participate um, with us, and it was an after the fact. Uh, you know, we approached them after we had been um, notified that we were accepted into the program, and they said yes, they would like to participate, and we capped um, their contribution at $1,000. Uh, because that's what they were comfortable with. And then uh, Marika just tracked her hours that she used within the city um, so that we'll just invoice them uh, for that amount. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, um, I think the information is showing that it, it would be beneficial for the city of Quinell to participate. And we're able to, uh, to work um, with you for whatever uh, amount uh, works out for you. Good. Open, open for questions. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Uh, Director Bolton, do you happen to recall when the last year was that we participated? Yeah, it was 2014 and 2015 we participated in the program, yeah. So we have participated in the past uh, when we went through our um, two years of pretty significant operating um, reductions, operating cost reductions. That's when this got caught up in that. So, so the floor is open for council. Questions or comments? Councillor Paul. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I guess this would be more, I think, a question to Chris, and that is that um, is, a, is a resident kind of obligated or encouraged to report a sighting? Uh, the reason I ask is I've had many sightings over the summer. They haven't been a problem. In fact, we kind of like to see the bears, and, and there's no concern, but do we have an obligation or is there some kind of a, a, a process where we should be reporting that sighting? Uh, there's no there's no obligation for the public to report just a sighting. Um, I, I encourage people if they do have a sighting, if they're having frequent sightings, to report it. Um, especially earlier in the in the spring because that allows me to get on to a bear I can manage it and I can utilize some hazing techniques to try and um, keep that bear in the green spaces or push it out of town uh, it also allows me to provide education to uh, the property owners to ensure that a the number one reason why the bear is there is because of attractants um, and if the attractants are properly secured the bears feeling safe on someone's property which is fine, but we want to make sure that they don't become habituated where they lose their fear of people. So, because once they become habituated, um, then that leads to the public safety and oftentimes the bear has to be destroyed. So, you know, to answer your question, no, you don't have to. Um, there isn't a legal obligation to, um, unless you're having to take um, action against the bear. Then there's um, requirements under the Wildlife Act to report it, especially if you're having to, for example, shoot the bear, because that's definitely happening around town. So, um, but like like I said, I'd like people to call us, uh, especially in the earlier parts of the year, so then we can try and manage it. Um, also, some of the information I can pass on to wild safe coordinators and have that communication with them, saying that we are seeing some uh, conflicts in these areas and she can go out and provide that education um, to the community so yeah hopefully that answers your question thank you thank you other comments or councillor rudenberg thank you and yep. thank you for your presentation um, so in regards to that very point um, the education piece is huge because um, you know, watching social media and somebody asked a question about, uh, you know, who do they call about a bear being in their yard, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I gave them the rap number, the rap line, um, all of a sudden it was like, oh no, if you call those guys, it's a dead bear. Right off the bat, that's exactly where they went yeah. to, instead of the fact that they need to understand that there's a whole process that goes in place. So education is a huge piece of this. And, um, yeah knowing where we went back a couple of years ago with Wild Safe BC and the Bear Wear program, I think it's an important piece to this community right now. Other questions or comments? Um, I would just... Yeah, get if, sorry, go ahead, Chris. So 
great. Yeah, if, if I can just add to that, you know, that's an excellent point. Um, it's incredibly frustrating for me for someone to refuse to call because they just assume that I'm just going to show up and kill a bear. Um, that's that's always going to be the last resort. Um, you know, I, I will admit, unfortunately, in the past, um, it has been quicker and easier just to dispatch a bear and destroy a bear. That's not the way of the future. That's not going to be, that's not the way it happens. Um, providing that education piece and managing bears is the only way to reduce the conflicts that we're seeing uh, within town. So, uh, Chris, can you comment on how often RCMP would be engaged either in an aggressive bear situation or if you're going to have to engage to uh, put a bear down? So I work very closely with the RCMP. Um, we both operate on the same uh, radio frequencies and dispatchers. So if somebody calls the RCMP to report a bear issue, uh, I'm getting the phone call as well. Um, oftentimes, the RCMP, they're, of course, they're always on, on shift 24-7, so they can respond much quicker than I can. Um, also, uh, for the past year and a half, I've been the only CO in town, so my response is at times can be uh, a bit challenging so um and if i'm not available i i work so close to the rcmp i can call them directly and say this is where the bear is um let's ex i know if i know what the bear is what its behaviors are they can uh, respond appropriately with uh, the right hazing techniques or if need be they can um dispatch a bear for example that bear that was up on jones street right in town that's um individual decided it would be a good idea to put an arrow in it. The RCMP uh, were there and were able to action appropriately and dispatch that bear in a humane way. So um, I do heavily rely upon uh, the assistance of the RCMP. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thanks for that. I know we had a situation in Phillips Road in South Hills where uh, the whole street was locked down with multiple RCMP officers uh, involved and that did end up uh, in the bear being shot. I think for council, just in terms of you know our budget deliberations and in terms of reducing the number of incidences, you know, it's a large chunk of change for us, and we're trying to make sure that our RCMP resources are used in an appropriate way. So, um, yeah, so, for sure. So thank you for this, and, and I appreciate the update. It's timely. Uh, you know, it's in good timing for our budget deliberation discussions, and Director Bolton can tag it as part of our uh, finance committee. Uh, conversation and Tara, you know, we've, your January time frame for us to engage with you should council decide to move in this direction uh, works for us uh, from a budget perspective too. So, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for your work in the presentation, even if it froze. So. Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks for calling in, Chris, even though you weren't feeling well. And, uh, and Tara, hopefully you're still mending well. Yeah, I'm back on my feet, so awesome. getting there. Good. <laughs> Take care. All, All right. right. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Have a good night. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Councillors, uh, forbearance, uh, just because we have two very hardworking people who are kind of tapped out these days, I'm sure, uh, I would suggest that uh, we could uh, do K3 uh, before we get into our normal business, if that's okay with you, Director Turner. Okay, and Council's good with that? Okay, go ahead, Director Turner, on K3. Thank you, Mayor. So the purpose of this report is to review the form and character resulting from the change of use at 490 Carson Avenue back to a restaurant uh, uh, in residential mix as well as off street parking design which includes two variances. Uh, in summary, the development is um, a review of the conversion um, as, as previously described. The off street parking traffic flow of the property egresses and ac accesses were reviewed under this DP. Two variances are being requested in regards to the off-street parking requirements. New signage on the building is also being proposed and reviewed. Staff is recommending approving the development permit and variances. Just some background for you. Um, the proposal um, 
Napkin is proposing to convert this building to a dine-in catering restaurant with 79 seats uh, available post-COVID um, on the main floor and a residential unit on the second floor. Although the restaurant did exist in this building for many years, its use was converted to daycare for a few years. Conversion back to the restaurant does not include building occupancy considerations um, at uh, and does excuse me does include and the conformance with the parking requirements the second floor residential unit is intended to be used by the operators of the restaurant the two variances are being requested to reduce the number of required parking spaces and reduce the minimum width of the two-way parking aisle to access the parking spaces on site additional off-street parking will be provided at the rear of 184 Davy Street which is the Chrysler building uh, or sorry the uh, a Chrysler bu building Signage is being proposed for the restaurant on three building frontages, north, east, and west. A development permit is required to assess the proposed development with respect to the overall site design and consideration of the required variances. Um, so as you'll see, um, this property is, although it's converting back to a previous use, this use is permitted at this site uh, in the zone of C3, downtown commercial. The proposed accessory dwelling unit meets the rest of the zoning regulations except the parking requirements. I'm going to discuss the parking requirements next. The, um, the, the variance for off-street parking stalls for the intended use for, uh, of restaurant and accessory drawing will be reduced to three, where the required number would usually be 41. Obviously, this is a pre-existing site and um, had uh, uh, a, a different uh, or had parking that was in the front of the building. It's now an issue due to access and egress. Highways wants very limited to no access and egress off this site, and we've worked with the uh, the applicants to 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 work around and design a parking plan for that. It basically came down due to the site configuration of that area uh, requiring the parking to be limited to three uh, stalls which will be used for for uh, employees and for the owners of the business uh, the uh, proposal in terms of the character uh, form and character um, uh, it does not include significant changes to the outward uh, appearance of the building at this time. Uh, the owner has indicated they will be looking at improvements la later in the process uh, in, in a few years. The ability to improve access, circulation, and parking on the site was the main component of, of this report, or sorry, of this review. Um, the Ministry of Highways, you will note, uh, has not completely responded to us yet. However, they have given us an indication of what their response will be, the, um, just what requirements they will have in terms of, in terms of how to uh, improve the access and parking and uh, information along the highway frontage. They're likely going to require some no parking signs along the front and requirements for some barricades um, is the message I've gotten. Thus far, uh, the uh, uh, applicants are aware and uh, know that whatever they require, we'll, we'll need to put forth uh, with for the uh, for the development. So at this point, I'd like to just go into. Um, oh, sorry, I should be a little bit more clear on that access point. That access point um, for the site. Due to the configuration, access will be off the lane. So the lane, uh, uh, the individuals accessing the parking lane in the front, which again is just staff and the owners, um, they'll go off the lane and will be going um, inside the parking lot um, uh, around the signage that's currently there um, on the site. Um, it's it's a narrow uh, entryway, but again, it's only for those three vehicles and only for individuals um, that are that are on site as such as staff and and the owners so with regards to the recommendation the recommendation is that council approve dp 2020-29 on lots 12 and 13 block 42 town of quinnell plan 17,000 for the establishment of a new restaurant on the main floor and the residential on the second floor as proposed on the attached plans and that council approves varying sections 5.6.2 and 5.10 of the city of cornell zoning bylaw 1880 2019 to reduce the number of required off-street parking spaces to three large car spaces and that council approve varying section 5.7.5 of the city of cornell zoning bylaw 1880 of 2019 to reduce the number to reduce the minimum width of a two-way aisle to 5.9 meters as shown on the attached site plan subject to fulfilling the recommendations made by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure regarding access and Carson Avenue, Avenue frontage. 
So on the recommendation, Councillor Vix will move. Councillor Rudenberg, questions or comments? Councillor Paul. Uh, thank you. I, I must say that I find this uh, very encouraging, especially, um, you know, at this difficult time and, and that this is a real vote of confidence in our local economy. But I do have one question of staff and that that is that um, would or could the, the Ministry of Transportation and Highways um, requirements for no vehicle ingress or uh, um, ingress or egress from Carson Avenue, would that requirement still hold if Carson Avenue becomes a regular city street post um, interconnector? Thank you. No, we could definitely relook at that whole configuration at that point when it becomes a city street. We have had that discussion with the owners. Councillor Vic. Just want to thank the, the proponents for taking the leap and uh, certainly support the support the recommendation and uh, look forward to seeing you guys up and running again. Anything else? I would just ditto that comment. Thank you uh, for this. And, you know, I think on behalf of Council, I really wish you all the best. It's one of the most difficult times for the business that you're in. Um, but as Councillor Paul intimated, I think the game plan we have for that entire area, uh, uh, you know, and, and as we keep tracking on the interconnector, it's going to be, you're going to be in the heart, along with Barkerville Brewery and others, you're going to be in the heart of what we hope is a high traffic, pedestrian, mobile area. area. So, you know, uh, fingers crossed you can get through the near term and we'll keep working on the midterm uh, to make it uh, a good uh, environment for you. So thank you. So on the recommendation, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thanks very much. Okay, back to our agenda then. Uh, turning it over to Councillor Vic, Executive Committee Report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is um, a small conclusion to my report from our last Council meeting where I reported out on our uh, executive committee meeting of October 19th. Specifically, uh, I think I'm seeking a council uh, approval of our terms of reference for the executive committee. Um, considering uh, developments late last week where we uh, completed a collective agreement, um, two of our uh, items on our uh, uh, terms of reference for the exec executive committee are no longer pertinent and no longer relevant considering that new collective agreement. So I guess I would be seeking a motion from Council to accept our terms of reference for executive. So you, you can make the motion, just look for a second. Oh, I'll, I'll make that motion. Okay, Councillor Vic seconds. Uh, questions or comments? Second. Sorry, Counsel <laughs> I had Councillor Runge in my eyes. Uh, Councillor Runge seconded. Uh, questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? Carried, thank you. Okay, next uh, we move on to Councillor Runge for PABCOM. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so this, uh, is, this reports to uh, inform Council of what was discussed at the October 22nd uh, meeting of uh, policy and bylaw. So the first, uh, uh, the first uh, point of our meeting, uh, we discussed a property disposition policy, uh, uh, strategic initiatives and uh, CR policy 2.2, which will be brought up by uh, Director Turner shortly. We had great discussions, uh, w which included pre-land disposition, facilitation considerations, funding model ideas, and just general healthy uh, deliberations. The rest is all in the report and also will be covered by Director Turner. Uh, the second uh, thing that we uh, talked about was the Council Procedure Bylaw, Electronic Meetings and Attendance. And uh, further to the research provided uh, by uh, our fine uh, manager of legislative services, uh, Gina. Uh, we discussed uh, the community charter council and our council procedure 18, uh, bylaw 1889. Uh, we also looked at what other municipalities policies were, had some discussions on that. Uh, we looked at electronic meetings becoming more of a norm and also what some of the pitfalls that happen as we have more uh, uh, electronic meetings, you know, with regards to security connections, professionalisms of backgrounds, loss of audio, or also for the quorum uh, being required. Uh, we actually 
the discussions went on fairly long, so we didn't come to a total conclusion, and PAPCOM is still in deliberations uh, of policy changes that will be focused on. And uh, the policy changes that we're thinking of or that we were coming to, and we'll look at again this uh, next week uh, at our meeting, uh, will be focused on the intent of the community charter to have a robust and full quorum at these meetings, and that we uh, continue to have council uh, meetings uh, that have elected officials attending in person as much as possible. So we'll be looking at the policy 1889 next meeting and see if there's any alternative wording in the bylaw which allows for this attendance, but also respects the intention of the community charter. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I, I just want to make a comment uh, further to that so that council is clear uh, and for the public to be clear too. A as we move into the world of electronic medium, right now our policy is so wide open that technically you could decide that you wanted to stay in your PJs and stay at home and zoom in. And that's going to be even more so when we get to the point uh, that we actually have that ability to have people on camera in the room and we have all of that technology there. That was never the intent. So the kinds of things of if you're in town, the intention is you will be in chambers unless we're either under a state of emergency or there's an ongoing medical condition that prevents you. That kind of language to just kind of clean that up. The other piece of it is things like vacation. And the intention is for council to be able to take vacation. And so the very fact that we've got the ability, you know, to dial in or to zoom in or whatever the case may be, doesn't mean that council needs to feel compelled that if they're away on vacation, then they're going to also zoom in. You know, it's just that management issue around that. But the other aspect of that on the quorum piece is if we did have some people away on vacation or somebody's away on council business or whatever the case may be, and we happen to have a three in person four online, well, do we actually have a quorum? Because if the call drops, so if the technology fails, we end up losing quorum with the in presence. So this isn't to stop us from having the flexibility that we want from this. It doesn't, it's not to stop us from if in a situation we're in where we need to quickly move into a full electronic uh, situation, or we have situations now where somebody's waiting for a positive COVID test and wants to do the right thing and stay home and dial in. That's not the intent is to negate that. It's just to make sure that we don't build a trap for ourselves where we undermine the functionality of, of council and not meet the intent of the charter that first and foremost council members are present in council chambers when we have our regular posted meetings. So that's, it's, as Councillor Runge indicated, we're just going to have to evolve this as we kind of figure out this new world uh, that we're stepping into. And I would argue that most organizations are in the same boat with respect to people working away and, you know, various other things. So, so it'll be an ongoing conversation. Any other comments or questions around this one? Okay. So moving on then to um, North Caribou Seniors Council, Councillor Vic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm reporting out on a uh, uh, North Caribou Seniors Council meeting that uh, I, I attended on October 28th, where I represented the city as the liaison. A uh, couple, uh, couple major items I'll review tonight. The first of which was um, the housing, sur the seniors housing survey was uh, presented to the NCSC that day, and there was a couple really interesting statistics that came out of that survey. Um, if, if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll just review a couple. Uh, first one is 68% of seniors uh, who took the survey indicate that their residence will not be suitable for them in the next five to 10 years. And that's a staggering number that shows how many people are going to require some measure of uh, proper uh, uh, housing in the very near future. Another interesting statistic, 89% of seniors um, who took the survey indicate they do not want to leave our community. They want to age in place in our community in some fashion. Um, another interesting statistic, 63% of respondents indicated that they have 100% equity in their current residence. So that illustrates that if there was some housing option for them, they, they have the money to actually uh, take advantage of suitable housing, yeah. whether that's a gated community or uh, condominiums, whatever. 
Um, uh, regarding the, uh, the, there's a good news, bad news story with the uh, inventory side. Part of our, um, the NCSC mission was to determine the inventory side, so uh, give seniors options in terms of where they can contact to uh, locate uh, housing options. And unfortunately, we had very little uptake from uh, landlords, owners of uh, uh, applicable housing. And that's by virtue of the fact that there is such high demand in the community, there's little motivation for landlords to, to list their um, uh, opportunities for residents on a website to be viewed by seniors. However, having said that, uh, Anna Rankin, our coordinator, did a tremendous job in researching every apartment building in our community, available suites, available seniors uh, opportunities like uh, uh, gated communities. She's, she's done a phenomenal job collecting that data and we are still going to have that as an information piece on the NCSE, NCSE website. So that was the housing um, announcement uh, in terms of the survey, which was a great partnership between the City of Quinnell, the North Caribou Seniors Council. Um, a couple other items we discussed at the meeting is um, uh, the iPads that the city recently uh, gave back to the community, uh, many of them ended up with our uh, senior center, but some did end up with the NCSC. And we're gonna be creating a partnership with Literacy Quinnell, more specifically the learning center component of Literacy Quinnell, to offer seniors uh, an opportunity to learn that technology in a structured fashion where they can learn uh, with the device in their hands. So that was a good announcement. Also, uh, a huge, push on the meeting uh, uh, was our volunteer requirement. I'm, I'm happy to say that our grand opening last Friday, we did sign up over 30 memberships and, and several of those new memberships will turn into volunteers, um, which is a great segue to the next um, issue that, that we're very cognizant of at, at the NCSC, which is fatigue of volunteers. A lot of the work is falling to a very small group of people and we're very cognizant of the fact that these, this is a burden for volunteers and that work has to be spread out and also calls into, the que into question the sustainability of the council. There has to be a way to offer assistance to the council in, for in form of um, more paid help. So we'll be looking uh, for gaming grants to offer some permanent funding to assist us with that component. Also, uh, we'll be looking to other partners, including the city of Quinnell, to help us with that sustainability piece. And lastly, I'll mention that uh, the, uh, the NCSC has successfully completed their yard maintenance program, which was a very uh, well-received um, program. And we've successfully uh, got approval from one of the grant funder to offer a snow removal component of that residual funding to take over now, more or less, as the snows hit the ground. And it's really uh, enlightened the group that this is a program that really requires sustainable funding because the demand is so great from seniors. So, and last thing I'll mention is uh, the AGM for the NCSC is November 25th at the Senior Center at 5.30 p.m. And looking forward to seeing some visitors. Thank you, Councilor Vic. Any questions or comments? For Councillor Vic, uh, seeing none. Okay, I think those uh, stats are <clears throat> very interesting for us, and I, I look forward to the final results because they should infuse our conversation coming up uh, as we take a look at our housing agenda. Uh, with respect to council reports, just the mayoralty appointments uh, moving into 2021, and basically it's just a status quo. Uh, so for the first half of the year, continuing with Councillor Vic, second half of the year, Councillor Elliott, and then for the co-chair for North Caribou Joint Advisory uh, Committee, Councillor Rudenberg, continuing in that role. So if I can have a motion to that effect. Councillor Runge, so moved. Councillor Vic, second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Um, moving on then to city staff reports, disposition of lands as per our PABCOM uh, report. So K1, uh, Director Turner. Thank you, Mayor. This uh, report is to review the disposition policy for lands that have been identified by Council as lands that may achieve a strategic ni initiative of Council. Um, this policy has been prepared, reviewed by PABCOM, is now, is, and now is provided for Council's consideration. Uh, just going into the background, I'm going to skip the, the, the 
first bit of the background that uh, Council has reviewed a couple of these policies now and we've uh, talked about uh, the community charter rules and requirements for municipalities disposing of lands. Um, again, we've looked at policies regarding surplus lands to abutting properties. This policy has been reviewed and approved by Council and uh, the disposition policy for strategic initiatives is coming tonight and PABCOM will be shortly reviewing the disposition policy for surplus parks. Um, Disposition of lands and strategic initiatives. I'll talk about quickly the uh, process of which is described in the policy. Council has requested this uh, for, a, uh, for a policy that will guide the process for staff when they bring uh, disposition requests uh, uh, of strategic municipal or st st strategic properties for municipal purposes um, for to council for consideration. The following steps will be used. Municipal lo owned lands will be presented to PAMCOM with a report on past use and current intended future use. PABCOM will identify strategic, strategic uses to consider marketing, la marketing lands for and to identify any conditions of sale, for example, minimum density, market readiness, etc. Staff will then provide a report that identifies the following costs associated with disposition, appraisal of value of the lands, as well as estimating cost of servicing for the lands. Council will confirm the conditions of sale and identify minimum purchase price. A property listing or request for proposal will be prepared with a rating system to meet strategic initiatives. Uh, conditions to be discussed in each case with PABCOM with respect to the market readiness that the parcel should be brought to um, will occur. This will depend on the strategic directive uh, that Council provides to staff for that parcel. Um, the policy is attached for your consideration. The recommendation is that Council approves Disposition of Lands Strategic Initiatives Policy CCR 22. Floor is open for comment or uh, motion. Councillor Rudenberg. Making motion. Councillor, uh, sorry, Councillor Goulet second. Floor is open. Comments, uh, Councillor Paul. Yeah, thank you. I wonder if I could get a clarification from staff on um, the financial implications on page 32 um, it says that disposition of properties may be used for acquisition of land improvements and capital projects I I'm having trouble with that like it seems almost like it contradicts itself Go ahead, Director Turner. So that, that is actually the requirements of the legislation of to, as to which, uh, what we can use the funds. So when we do put a uh, parcel out for sale, we are limited in its use, uh, uh, those funds use for d different projects, and that's what uh, those projects are. Thank you. That, that explains it. Thank you. Yeah, we are trying to get some clarification, though, on whether or not, because you'll see in here, so, so council is clear, and I think the policy is is a good place for us because we're now going to be taking a look at, you know, some of the lands that are available for infill development and to be made available so that we can get some of the housing to the point that Councillor Vic made before. In our housing strategy, what was pointed out is that some of the issues we have with land, if it's undeveloped land, then the return to the investor. Uh, is is a long term it's part of our problem here if we have some property where it's a matter of us doing a nominal improvement to that property in advance of making that property available for sale so that it actually will get picked up and it actually will get developed those are the kinds of things that are going to come forward to council for consideration the question we've got is whether or not land sale money could then be used to do any of the preparatory work for land that we're putting up for sale and it's the community charter seems to be clear that the answer would be no uh, but there also seems to be a little bit of gray or fuzziness so we're going to get clarity on that before we get to that point uh, but there are some properties that we've got that is you know maybe just a simple tie-in it may be you know doing a little bit of advanced work so that the all the utilities are there and it's easy for somebody to go in and develop or that there's a zoning uh, or OCP change that should be done in advance so that the property actually is available for what we want it to be available for that's the kind of thing that's noted in here that you know that will be put in front of council so if you really want to make sure that this property is used for the intended pur purpose and is used quickly and developed for the intended purpose here's some changes you may want to consider for 
X amount of investment on the front end before you make it available, right? So the community charter appears to be you should only use land sales uh, for land purchases. Um, we're trying to get it clear whether or not we can actually use land sales for preparation for future land sales. Okay, Councillor Paul. Uh, thank you. With regard to the actual policy um, on disposition of land and strategic initiatives, and that's on page 34 and 35, bullet number 30, or pardon me, bullet number three, the very last bullet on page 35 under sale of municipal property will not be considered under the following conditions. I think <coughs> that bullet number three answers my question, but I just want to be clear that, that if we have land that has been conditionally donated or bequeathed to the municipality, would that fall into that category? Or are we free to sell um, all property regardless of how it was acquired by the city? Thank you, Councillor Paul. That's a loaded question. There's a lot that we'd have to research on each part property. I couldn't say just a blank statement on that. Of course, we will bring that to you. We will do the research behind each parcel and, and, and let you know if there's any conditions that would limit sale. And then it's Council's determination. So, so Councillor Paul, just again, so we're clear, that point, that bullet that you've pointed to doesn't doesn't have anything to do with what you're raising. That would be more front end. This is more back end. So that point says that any point during the process, if we're just not comfortable with how things are going, or we've been given some information, or it doesn't look like it's going to track the way we want it to, we can just stop the process at any time. What you're talking about would be front end. So prior to us deciding that a piece of property was going to be disposed of, we would deal with all of those deliberations about whether it has a covenant on it or whether it's a kind of restricted um, area or whether, you know, the OCP change may be impacting the community. That would all be front end and transparent in the process. But the, the bullet you're pointing to says also any time throughout the process, if council starts to get a bit uncomfortable, they can also pull the plug, right? So you've got a front and a back end process there to make sure that it's that it's tracking. Uh, Councillor Runch. Yeah, I just actually wanted to echo that because one of the, in, in my report, which I didn't read to you because I thought we'd all read it, uh, was actually that we, uh, that those discussions on land and uh, you know disposition of land would actually would be discussed in a closed council meeting prior to it just to follow community charter rules and we then decide which parcels we'd even be looking at before we even went into this so my apologies for not reading it out to everyone before okay any other comments or questions on the policy so on the recommendation on the policy all in favor any opposed carried Director Turner, on uh, where are we at here? Uh, the two on the OCP and zone amendments for Webster. Thank you, Mayor. This report is for consideration of amending the zoning, zoning of Webster Avenue Park, that's 420 Webster Avenue, to P1 Institutional to allow for the construction of a 57-space daycare facility. The Community Development Coordinator, as you know, made application for, for grant funding for the development of a daycare space in the community. Webster Avenue Park has been determined as the most suitable location for this development due to high need for daycare spaces in the West Quinnell area and the physical characteristics of the site. Amendments to convert this site to instance of institutional zoning are recommended by staff. Consultation considerations required for an official community man plan amendment in addition to a public hearing are proposed for cons council's consideration. I'm just going to move right into the background which describes some of that. The Community Development Coordinator, again, has made uh, this application. Um, the facility and land will be city property with an operator agreement in place for facilities operation. The Quinnell and District Daycare Society has committed to entering into an agreement with the city for the operation of the facility. The proposed site is 420 Webster Avenue, shown on the location map. This is currently zoned and utilized as park. There is a Play, there is playground infrastructure on the south 
west end of the lot, which is anticipated to be utilized by the daycare and fenced off from public use. The zoning of the property is to be amended to allow for group daycare use. This use is only permitted as a principal use in commercial zones or in the in institutional zone. The official community plan designation for this site must first be amended from P to from park to institutional use to, per, first to excuse me to facilitate this zoning amendment. Uh, the process and recommended consultation activities. The site is currently zoned and utilized as parkland. This report establishes initial consideration of the bylaw amendments and consultation requirements for amending the zoning to P1 Civic Assembly and Institutional. This initial review of the project will provide the first opportunity for public consultation. Referrals to internal departments and external agencies will be sent out regarding this project following first reading of the subject bylaws as per normal application processes. In addition to letters, to these letters will also be sent out to the Caribou Regional District, our local First Nations uh, of the Lataco Diné Nation, the Nazca First Nation, Estee Law, and Kluskas Diné Nation as well as School District 28, uh, introducing the proposed project and requesting input. The project will also be posted online for public input. Following grant funding confirmation, the application will return to Council for second reading with any recommended amendments to the plan. Summary of consultation input, posting of updates to the development plans to the City's website, and setting of a public hearing date. These notices will be mailed to properties within 100 meters of the site and a sign will be posted on the property advising of the proposed bylaws public hearing date. If the grant is not successful, Council can then determine whether or not to proceed with the zoning amendment prior to second reading and uh, setting of the uh, public hearing. I'm going to move into the recommendation. The recommendation is that Council provides first reading of proposed official community plan amendment bylaw number 1894 and zoning amendment bylaw number 18. 95 to allow the use of daycare on lot 1, block 1, district lot 704, Caribou district plan 6719 under the bylaw section of the agenda, and that council has considered consultation as per section 475 of the local government act and direct staff as follows. Send correspondence to the Caribou Regional District, Lataco Dene Nation, Nazco First Nation, SD Law Nation, Kluskas Nation, and the School District Number 28, immediately notifying of the proposed amending bylaws and proposed project. Post draft development plans on the city's web website following, uh, following this meeting, allowing for feedback, noting final design plans will complete, be completed following grant approval and complete second reading and set the public hearing date uh, following finalization of the plans. So on the recommendation, Councillor Runchell moves. Councillor Vick second. Questions or comments? Okay. All in favor of the recommendation? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you, Director Turner. Okay. And we've done three. So over to four, City Manager on the Community Forest. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the purpose of this report is to seek approval of Council to take the next steps towards the development of a community forest partnership. Council has previously indi indicated its willingness to proceed with a community forest allocation. These resolutions in contained in this report will help to move this initiative along. So the current status of the CFA initiative is as follows. There are a number of partners who have confirmed that they're interested in participating, and that is Lataco First Nation, Nazco First Nation, Estela First Nation, and the City of Cornell. The Kluskas First Nation and the CRD are still uh, thinking about it. They haven't decided that they want to participate yet. The actual invitation to apply for a CFA has not been issued by the province at this point, but it's we are waiting for it momentarily, well not momentarily, but very soon. We feel that it is imminent. A significant challenge to proceeding with the community forest application is the upfront expense required. And this is estimated by Susan Mulkey, who's the chair of the, uh, of the uh, Community Forest Association, to be between five to six hundred thousand dollars spread over two years. So that's a big chunk of change. One concept being considered by the province is to create a non-replaceable forest license, a NERFL, the net proceeds of which would be used to fund the upfront costs. And I just may say, uh, I guess as the 
bit of editorializing. That's a pretty groundbreaking step by the province even to suggest that. I don't know of another one where they went through this step. Typically communities have to raise their funding for this. So that's potentially huge but not locked in place yet. If this NERFL does not materialize, the partners will need to fund the CFA development through a combination of their own funds and or grants. For either of those funding arrangements, the working group has requested that the City of Cornell should hold and administer the funding derived from the NERFL or alternately if we go from uh, own source funding that we would hold the funding collected for this. And we would then administer that funding by issuing uh, checks as appropriate uh, as expenses are, uh, as expenses come around for the community for us. Our, our Director of Finance, Carrie Bolton, sees no issues with that. She thinks it's doable. It's not presumed to be a huge amount of workload at this point in time uh, because it's, it, it, at the end of the day, there won't be all that many checks issued. So two groups have been set up to manage the, de the development of the community for us. The partner group is comprised of the elected leaders of the various communities, so the First Nation Chiefs and the Mayor. And this group helps to develop the vision and partnership goals for the community forest. And the technical working group is made up of key staff of the member organizations. So this group will be to help develop the technical, the legal, and the policy framework for the CFA. Aaron Robinson, our community forest initiatives manager, has been participating in this group. And through this process, the Flynn Lord is very engaged in this process in helping to, to see this through. As well, there's also assistance, as mentioned, from the Community Forest Association. So there's other groups helping out, but it's important to note that community forests are not cookie cutter arrangements where everyone's the same, you just pull it off, pull something off the shelf and here's a community forest. Everyone is different. They have a different policy structure, a different ownership structure, a different management structure. So because of that, there is a ton of issues that need to be worked through and just shaped before the final proposal is completed. So a description of the, sorry, let me back up a step. We're also asking approval for council uh, to enter into a participation agreement. And this participation agreement covers off this, this first portion of developing what this vision for the community for us will be. And it, there's some language included in the um, appendix one to this report where it talks about that participation agreement. We haven't got it totally nailed down yet. So we're asking council for uh, permission to proceed with something uh, substantially similar to the document which is attached to, which is attached in appendix one I'm not going to read that whole document it's a fairly long piece even though I do like reading reports verbatim um, the recommendation on this will be that it, it's multiple recommendations that Cornell City Council authorizes the city to enter into a participation agreement that is substantially similar to the participation agreement as described in appendix one of this report and Mayor, do you want to handle these all individually or? Yeah, I, let me just comment on a couple of things and bring council up to date since uh, the report <clears throat> was put together by the city manager and then we can open it up for questions. So um, this uh, spirit and intent kind of resolution is going forward to the First Nations groups as well. So Lataco uh, has signed off and the nominal contribution that we asked for, they've already cut a check uh, for that. Uh, NASCO is dealing uh, with the same situation in front of their council, so it will be that same thing that we, we, we know that we're moving together. We know that the first phase will be the NERFL, the management of the NERFL. The second phase will be the evolution of the agreement that leads us to a community forest license. So that's why there's a bit of fluidity to this because it is going to be a fluid and evolving uh, process. Our um, technical team made up of Aaron Robinson uh, from our forestry initiatives uh, um, uh, group, uh, the uh, Jean um, Ritchie, is that right? I got it wrong in my head. Anyway, Jean from uh, Lataco, uh, Christy, thank you. And Florian from NASCO will be approaching uh, the Estela 
and uh, Kluskis uh, with a view to mapping this whole process out for them to get them to decide whether they're going to be involved in the NERFL process or they're going to wait until the uh, community forest process actually evolves. And we were supposed to have had a meeting with the Caribou Regional District yesterday, but there was a scheduling er uh, issue. So we'll meet with them before uh, our next community forest agreement to outline the process for them too. What's important for council to understand, if you take a look at what is your page 64 <coughs> of 88, is that for those who have not at this juncture been able to commit the resources or commit the time, what we've said to Flynn Ward is we need to be able to map out a process that makes it clear to those who are not engaged in the initial partnership agreement, who are not engaged in the NERFL process, that we have expectations of them that they're going to be able to make decisions when it comes time for the community forest uh, license to be issued. So you'll see that milestone one, about six months into the process, we'll be going back to those individual gr or, or sort of groups, that, and particularly Kluskis in the Caribou Regional District, we're not quite sure about Estela just now, uh, and say to them, okay, we're now at this point, this is how uh, the land base looks at this point, this is how the basic structure looks at this point, are you on track for wanting to come in so that when we get to the point that we're signing a license, et cetera, you've done all your due diligence, you know exactly uh, what it's gonna take for you to participate or not, and begin to get them prepared. So that when we hit milestone two, which is the, this is the go, no go. We are going to be forming the community for uh, partnership uh, for the license. We're going to be actually forming the community forest corporation or whatever the structure will be that they can say yes or no at that point. So the pertinent part for us is that's very important for our partnership with the Caribou Regional District because the Caribou Regional District will have to go back to their board. They're going to have to get the board to either agree or not agree that they want to participate. If they do want to participate, they're going to have to begin all of the legal framework to be able to be set up so that when we come to them on milestone two, they're saying, yes, we've got the bylaw in place. Yes, we know what the share structure is. Yes, we know what the representative function is. We don't want to be coming to them at milestone two, which is we're about to receive the license and we're about to form the, the partnership and have the Caribou Regional District say, well, wait a second, we've now got to go to the board and figure out do we want the bylaw, do we want you know, to be participating, et cetera. So that's why we're doing it as two parallel processes. One is the NERFL, get it going, hopefully have a self-funded process, and then clearly outline a kind of calendarized, stepwise process so that those who are not engaged in the front end know we're coming at them at some point and they better be able to be saying yes or no. And what we've said to Flynnroard is we are not going to keep trying to make it palatable for groups to come in. At some point, there has to be a go, no go decision. So that's why we're trying to outline it ahead of time for them, okay? And this will work for the CRD because it's what they need to go back to the board and say, okay, you know, do you want to start doing the work? Do you want to start hiring the lawyers that are necessary for this? Do you want to start doing the bylaw that's necessary for this, et cetera, and force that board to start making some actual decisions as opposed to continually say, well, you know, we need to think about it a little bit more. We need this information or whatever. So, so that's, that's the key part of this uh, report, okay? With respect to the recommendations uh, then, um, I think we should uh, treat them separately. So on the first, uh, the council does authorize the city to enter into a participation agreement uh, with the kind of draft uh, that we've got here uh, of intention of that participation agreement. Can I have a motion to that effect? Councillor Vic, Councillor Rudenberg, questions or comments? Councillor Paul. Uh, thank you. Are there any, um, I'm presuming that there will be some anticipated startup costs that will be required to be contributed, uh, presumably equally, um, by the uh, confirmed partner participants and and how does that weigh on 
future um, participants that come on board down the road, will they be required to retroactively um, make their contribution to the pot as it moves forward? So the, as the city manager pointed out and as we brief council ongoing, we are in a very unique situation that if a non-replaceable forest license is issued, it should be a self-funded process. But right now we've asked, I believe it's $2,000 uh, from each of the current participating partners because we have to have a legal structure to be able to then get the license, receive it, and begin to structure the funds and so on. Uh, and right now it only looks like Nazco, Letaco, and ourselves uh, will pick up that. Uh, Council's already passed a motion to that effect. Uh, but that $6,000 I think is just a nominal amount to get on with it. If we don't get a NERFL, then yes, absolutely. Then we'll be coming back to Council and saying, because Council's already intimated that we would front end this, we would have an accounting agreement with the partners that any money we spend on establishing the community forest would be paid back uh, to us uh, from the community forest. But there's going to be hard costs there that, yes, if a partner's coming in later, there's going to be a cost uh, for that partner to come in later, right? Okay. Anything else on that? Okay, on the motion for the participation agreement, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, on the uh, recommendation that authorizes the mayor to be the city representative on the partner group with appropriate decision-making authority. A motion. Councillor Paul so moved. Councillor Vick second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, the Quinnell City Council authorizes the city manager or delegated staff member to be the city rep on the technical working group with appropriate decision-making authority. Councillor Paul so moved. Councillor Rudenberg second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? And that's Cornell City Council authorizes the Finance Department to provide assistance to the development of the community forest. Councilor Runso moved. Councilor Rudenberg second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, City Manager, for putting that together. Okay. Uh, correspondence. Ms. Albers. Thank you, Mayor. Council has received a letter from the Royal Canadian Legion Branch Number 94 advising that there will be no public sen oh my goodness. cenotaph ceremony in Quinnell. However, there will be a small closed service in the Legion Hall to honor our veterans. There will be no veterans dinner and wreaths laying by Legion members will already have been completed earlier at the cenotaph. Thank you, and uh, I have responded in the affirmative uh, to attend the closed ceremony on behalf of Council. Uh, uh, and so this is for information and information uh, for the public. And I think this is a big hit for Quinnell because it is one of the things where our community shows out uh, in numbers. Uh, and so I think it's, you know, it, it's completely understandable and I think the appropriate thing to do. Um, but it will be sorely missed in the community uh, to have that event, so, okay. Um, next then, uh, the Canadian Minister of Heritage. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council has received a letter from the Honourable Stephen Gilbo, uh, advised that the city has received $415,000.967 in grant funding for the Museum and Visitor Information Centre renovation project. And as our museum curator, who uh, was the person behind this grant in the main, would tell you, this is $45 shy of what she asked for. So uh, there will be a hat passed around uh, at the end of a <laughs> council meeting to make up the difference. But uh, this is great news for us. We did not book uh, this grant uh, in our planning uh, for this project. So uh, at a time when, uh, you know, we don't know the what's happening with casino and some other uh, pressures we've got on our capital side, this is a, a really good news uh, item for us, so. Okay, questions or comments on that? Okay, so then moving on to our bylaws. Bylaw 1897, Comprehensive Fees Amendments, Final Adoption. Can I have a mover? Councillor Paul, so move. Councillor Goulet, second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, bylaw 1894, Official Community Plan Amendment, 420 Webster Avenue, first reading only. Councillor Vick, so moved. Councillor Run, second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. 
Bylaw 1895 for Webster for the first reading of the zone amendment. Councillor Rudenberg, Councillor Goulet, second. All in favor? Any opposed? Uh, and that's it. Okay, uh, no changes to upcoming meetings, changes to committee appointments, announcements, future events. Any? Okay, gallery questions. Seeing none. So I somebody checking the, probably the poll results from down south on an ongoing basis <laughs> uh, seeing no gallery questions I would invite a motion to adjourn Councilor Paul so moved Councilor Vic second all in favor any opposed uh, thank you very much staff and council